Okay, well, uh, welcome everyone to the second talk of the semester for TCS Plus. Uh, for those who don't know, TCS Plus is an online uh, seminar that we run. Um, it's been running for many years now and want to encourage people to, I don't know, help us out, help us organize if you want to organize a viewing in your own university, or we're always open to suggestions for talks that you'd think you'd want to see in TCS Plus. Um, and today, uh, we're very lucky to have Joaquim Blixstad. Uh, Joaquim is a PhD student at uh, KTH, and he'll tell us about um, communication and query complexity of bipartite matching. Now, before we begin, um, let me just say, so the talk is being recorded. We're going to post this talk um, on our website. Um, but I want to encourage everyone to turn their cameras on to give Joaquim some visual feedback. Um, and feel free to unmute yourself if you'd like to ask a question in between. Uh, but there will be um, a kind of a hangout session at the end of the talk uh, where we can ask questions and stuff without it being recorded. But okay, with that uh, being said, uh, Joaquin, the floor is all yours. Thank you so much. And uh, thanks for the invitation to give a talk. Yes, so. Yeah, I'm uh, Joachim Blikstad from uh, KTH in Sweden, and uh, I, yeah, I'm a PhD student here, advised by Danipon and Kai. And today I will tell you about the recent result of ours, as uh, Eric said, about communication and query complexity of bipartite matching. And this is a joint work with uh, Jan, Yuval, and Danipon and Sagnik. So let's get started. Yes, so. You probably all know the problem of bipartite matching, but let's define it anyway for completeness. So we're given a graph with a bipartition L and R, so two sides of the graph. Um, and we'll assume both sides have N vertices here, and then there's some edges up to M of them in between. And the goal is to find some maximum matching, a set of edges for which uh, each uh, uh, edge is only, like each vertex only has one edge incident to it. And, of uh, G, and we want to find as many of these edges as possible. Like find a maximum match, a ma matching of maximum size. Sorry. Yes. And uh, this has is a very well studied problem in like all the different settings, like in the sequential setting, the normal algorithm setting. And there have been some quite recent breakthroughs actually. So in 2020, it would solve showed how to solve it uh, in uh, almost linear time, uh, near linear time in uh, uh, for moderately dense graphs and uh, very recently by this uh, breakthrough uh, almost linear time max flow paper you can also solve it in uh, uh, almost linear time for sparse graphs too okay but uh, in this talk so it, like essentially it's this already settled in the sequential model like bipartite matching is solved used it's linear time right so we'll look at some a few different models so one cool model is the uh, two-party communication model. Here we have two players, Alice and Bob, in this case, and they each have a graph. And uh, we look at the union of their graphs. So you see Alice has some red edges, Bob has some blue edges, and we imagine this like union of their graphs, and they want to solve some graph problem on this union. And in this case, they want to solve uh, maximum matching. And in this case, it, for example, a perfect matching would be these uh, bold edges, and some of which belong to Alice and some of them which belongs to Bob. And what we measure here and want to optimize for is not the runtime of Alice and Bob, but how much they need to communicate with each other. So Alice knows her graph, Bob knows his graph, and they need to send messages between each other. And we measure how many bits of communication and they can send messages back and forward like interactively. And so this is what we try to use like as few bits of communication as possible. And uh, again, I want to note that we don't care about the internal running time of Alice and Bob, like they, they can solve NP hard problems if they want to. And then uh, as long as the messages they send are very short and concise. So let's look a bit at this model and do some first tries, like explore what we can do here. So a very trivial thing to notice is that sending a single edge needs log n bits. 
like you send the, the label of the left and right incident vertex. So a trivial protocol then is for Alice to take all her edges and just send them in a single message to Bob. And this you can do in like m log n time, so log n time per edge, or for very, very dense graphs, you can actually do it a bit faster in n squared time to just send the indicator vector of which edges exist in Alice's graph. And then after this, Bob has all the edges and he can solve the maximum matching problem and so um, So can we do better? It's a good question. Like here, linear time in M is not really, like it's already trivial. So we want something sublinear here in the number of edges. And it has been noticed by many people that uh, in fact, we can do better. And it's based on this uh, blocking flow algorithm by Hoppert Carr which in sequential time runs in like m root n runs. But the, in communication setting, you can actually change this m here to an n, so n root n bits of communication. And uh, this, the main idea of this is that like for hop crop crop, which is this augmenting path algorithm, you need to run like a few breadth first searches and depth first searches. And to run this in the uh, breadth first search in the communication model, you don't need to visit all the edges you just need to visit like the edges in the BFS tree and those are the ones you send. So you only need n log n bits of communication to implement the red first search or depth first search, which immediately then leads to like this, this object carp algorithm can be implemented in n squared n bits of communication. And this is uh, sublinear for dense enough graphs. So we, we don't need to send all edges, but can we actually do Better. Like we, we know how this, like there is now this uh, sequential, like almost linear time algorithm. Maybe we can do something similar, like convert to this M here in sequential setting to an N in the communication model. But uh, this uh, breakthrough max flow algorithm is quite complicated, uses a lot of continuous optimization. So this seems um, quite difficult to do, at least in my opinion. And um, but it still opens the question, like maybe there is some way to get linear in the number of vertices, like ON. Okay, so let's look at the other side. Do we have some like lower bounds? And indeed, say Alice has the full matching and Bob just has an empty graph, so Alice has a perfect matching. Then if Bob actually needs to output the matching and know the matching himself and not just the size of it, he will need to know all these edges from Alice. And like, Alice essentially has a permutation here and it needs n log n bits of communication like in terms of the information Bob needs to know. And in fact, even if you just look at the size version where Alice and Bob together need to output only the size of the maximum matching, not just the edges, like not the edges themselves, there is also like an n log n lower bound. However, only deterministic and it's still open if you can do it faster, like in linear time, for randomized total. Um, but uh, yes, so we ha have this kind of lower bound of n log n, and we have this upper bound of n root n currently. And the major question, like what is actually this communication complex of bipart matching? matching? This is a fundamental graph problem, one of the most well studied. And here we have a relatively fundamental model like this communication game, and so we have this gap between n log n and n root n, and this question has been asked by lots of different people throughout the years, from at least like three and a half decades back. And in fact, in our paper, we show that, uh, and I'll explain how today, that we can actually solve bipartite matching using only n log squared n bits of communication. I think this is uh, quite exciting. First off, like, it's only like a single log factor off from the lower bound, so quite tight. It would be nice to try to shave off this log factor in, either in the algorithm or prove a tighter upper bound, but still like almost tight. And another highlight is that actually our algorithm is quite simple and it follows from quite simple applications of already known techniques, namely the cutting planes method. As I'll explain more about this later. And another cute thing about this is that the even like we really abuse the communication model here. Like 
our algorithm has a very slow runtime. Like Alice and Bob needs to spend a lot of time to compute which messages to send, but they don't need to actually send very many bits between them. And the algorithm just finds like n log n edges and in the matching, it's n edges in a perfect matching. So only like a multiplicative factor of log n extra. So it, it doesn't do too badly in terms of finding edges. Okay, I also want to mention what? a few Sorry, different- Joachim? Yes, of course. Uh, can you see that last point again? So does the algorithm output the cost or it outputs the matching? Or? Oh, so our algorithm is deterministic and it actually outputs like both Alice and Bob at the end, it will know the edges of a matching, of the maximum matching. Very good question, yes, exactly. So in like, the algorithm will actually send like n log n edges between them. And among these n log n edges, there will be a maximum matching. And then Alice and Bob both know it. Yes. Okay. Like we also noticed that, um, that there are a few different related models, like query models. Now you can forget about for a while Alice and Bob and just say like there is some graph and we assume it's uh, like there is an underlying graph, but we don't know the edges of it. So it's hidden. So yeah, we, we don't know the graph and then we will have some query access to it. So the simplest query one can imagine is like an edge query. Like you can ask for a pair U and V whether this edge exists in the graph. In this case, it would be a node is this is the hidden graph underneath. Um, there's also other well-studied queries, namely the OR, XOR and AND query. Here we can ask for a set S of potential edges. So these ones marked in blue here, like these, like you ask for a set of pairs of potential edges and the OR query answers like, is any of these an actual edge of the graph? The AND query answers like, are all these edges of the actual graph? And the XOR query tells you the parity of the number of uh, these edges which appear in the graph. So for these examples, this is the hidden graph and you can see the answers here are like, yes, no, no, for the OR, XOR and AND query model. I also want to briefly mention like the quantum edge query model. It's again, just a simple edge query model. You ask for a pair U and V, but now you can put several of these queries in superposition and do some quantum magic and maybe get the, a faster algorithm and like a quantum query algorithm here. And all these models have been studied before. Some are already settled, both in terms of like upper bounds and lower bounds. So for instance, edge query, the only thing you can really do is like query all edges individually, but deterministic and randomized. For many of these models, like the best upper bound before our paper was this like n root n Hopcraft carp style algorithm again. So for instance, or query model or randomized XOR query model. Um, while, and for the quantum edge query model, there's also like a lower bound of n root n before and an upper bound of n to seven fourths. So you can actually beat in the quantum world, uh, the normal uh, edge query, like it helps having this quantum superposition of queries. And in our paper, we actually settle all of these uh, query models, either by proving a new tight upper bound or a new tight lower bound. And uh, all our upper bounds are based on the same ideas in the communication setting, which I'll explain shortly. And you just need to massage the idea a bit to work for these different query settings. And the, the lower bound is a relatively simple um, lower bound, which stems from communication complexity. And I think one highlight in this uh, table here is like for the extra query, where in the deterministic case, we need n squared queries. We need to query every edge essentially, while in the randomized case, n queries suffices. So it's kind of neat that you have this uh, quadratic gap between there, which I think is quite interesting. Okay, so this kind of concludes the introductory part and now I'll jump into the more of the details on how we achieve our new results. Okay, so like the one sentence key idea is that to apply cutting planes method to the dual vertex cover linear program. I'll explain this more in detail soon. And in fact, these kind of cutting play methods have been looked at before in the 
communication setting. So for general linear programs, where the constraints are split between Alice and Bob, then uh, Vimpala Van Woodruff recently showed that uh, using cutting planes, you can get this amount of communication. So like the dimension cubed times the number of bits per constraint when you need to share the constraint. And um, unfortunately, like just plugging in bipartite matching here would not be quite good enough. Like the dimension is n, so this would already be n cubed, and then it's better to just send all the edges. So we really need to abuse some crucial properties of the problem we're looking at, bipartite matching or the dual problem minimum vertex cover. So one reason why we look at the dual is that it has low dimension and the dimension will pop up in the number of iterations we need. And so for vertex cover, it has n has dimension instead of m for bipartite matching linear program. And other properties we abuse is that the constraints are very short. In fact, each constraint is just an edge. So they are cheap to send to each other between Alice and Bob. And we also need a property that in volume is small of this dual vertex cover linear pro program, but not too small. And this will, like the difference, like the ratio between like these volumes will determine the number of iterations we actually need in this cutting play method. So let's, let's look at this minimum vertex cover problem. So again, we're given a graph and uh, now we like a bipartite graph in this case, and we want to find a set of vertices C, which, so they cover all edges. So each edge has to be incident to some of these selected vertices C. So for example, if you select these vertices, this case is like one, two, three, four vertices, and you can easily check that each edge is covered here and that there is no way to select just three vertices for this particular graph. And, uh, an old theorem by Koenig says, says that uh, these are dual problems for bipartite graphs that, that the maximum matching is actually equal to the minimum vertex cover. But this, this only holds in bipartite graph and not in general graphs. And uh, in fact, we'll not only look at uh, vertex covers, but we'll also look at fractional vertex covers. So fractional vertex cover, we can select like half of a vertex or like 0.8 of a vertex and we needed that for each edge, like in total, the sum of the numbers of the two sides is at least one. So we cover this edge. So, and, and in fact, for bipartite graphs, the optimal fractional vertex cover is not better than the optimal integral vertex cover. So this, this is linear LP here is a, a integral. Okay, so let's look at this uh, linear program for the minimum vertex cover. So X here would be the fractional vertex cover. We want to minimize the number of vertices we select fractionally. Each edge has to be covered. And we can assume that uh, each uh, variable is between zero and one. Like it never makes sense to put more than one as a weight on a vertex. Okay. So first thing we can notice here that in a graph, in this communication model, some of the constraints belong to Alice and some belong to Bob because some edges belong to Alice, some edges belong to Bob. And let's look at this special case. Like here we have a minimization problem, like an optimization problem that's converted to a feasibility problem for simplicity first. So let's try to search, like is there a vertex cover of size at most n minus one? Note, if there is such a vertex cover, then by Koenig's theorem, it means that no perfect matching exists. On the other hand, if a perfect matching exists, there is no such vertex cover. So for most part of this talk, I will explain this like feasibility version instead, where instead of trying to find a maximum matching, we just want to determine in a graph owned by Alice and Bob together if a perfect matching exists. But in general, to generalize to find a maximum matching is uh, uh, almost the same. Okay, so we have this linear program and it's feasible if and only if no perfect matching exists. So we just need to determine if it's feasible or not. Okay, another thing we can note is that we have this minus one up here and minus one. And since the optimal solution is integral, we are allowed to add some slack here. So, in, 
So instead we'd say it's at most n minus a half. So even if I have a fractional vertex cover of size n minus a half, there is a way to round it down to a fractional vertex to an actual integral vertex cover of size n minus one. And this helps us a bit because then whenever P is feasible, we have just blown up the polytope a bit. So the actual volume, in this case, the two n dimensional volume here is, okay, it's still small, but not too small. And this will help us to find the number of iterations we need in our cutting planes. Okay, so let's look at these cutting planes uh, methods. To implement the cutting planes method, we need access to a separation oracle. And the separation oracle is essentially like we're given a point, y, in some, somewhere, and we're at, has to, we have to return either if y is in the polytope we're searching for, or if not, then we want to find like a separating hyperplane, which is separates y from all points inside the polytope. Okay, so let's look at this center of gravity cutting planes methods all the way back from the 60s, very old, independently discovered by uh, Lewin and Newman. Where, so the goal of the cutting planes method here is to find some point in some unknown polytope P and we are given some bounding box where P is contained in necessarily, and also access to this kind of separation oracle. Okay, so P, we don't know about it, right? So let's, uh, the task is to find some point in P, right? So what we do is we pick some point in this polytope, in fact, the center of gravity, and then call the separation oracle on this point. Maybe it returns, this is a separating uh, hyperplane, and then we can update our polytope Q, like we know everything in P must be contained in here now. And if we pick the center of gravity, we can, uh, uh, Grunbaum has argued that the volume actually decreases by a constant fraction. So, so Q here will, if we just repeat this process, the volume of Q will uh, decrease very rapidly by a constant fraction each, each iteration. And eventually, maybe if we pick the center of gravity here, it will be in the polytope P and we're done. We have found some point in the polytope P. Okay, so in fact, this algorithm is quite old and can solve linear programs, but in the sequential setting, it's quite slow. And the hardness here comes from computing the center of gravity of some polytope. In fact, it's sharp p hard to compute the center of gravity. However, in our communication model, we will see that Alice and Bob can just compute this internally. So we don't really care about it. Um, in fact, there are other points you can pick instead of the center of gravity, which you can compute in polynomial time, but still rather slowly, which will also decrease the volume by a constant fraction, but not quite as fast. Okay. So let's look at what this cutting plane method does for in this case of bipartite matching. Again, Alice has some edges, Bob has some edges, and here we'll keep a graph where the common edges, which they both know, and these are the edges like Alice have sent to Bob or Bob have sent to Alice. So in the beginning, we have this polytope Q, which is just like inside the zero one box. And we're searching for a minimum vertex cover of size at most n minus a half. And we also have this polytope P which we're actually searching for, which is the linear program for minimum vertex cover. So what do we do here? Again, we compute the center of gravity. It will be some uh, potential vertex cover here. So we will get some values on the vertices. In this case, the graph is empty. So it's 0 0.4 uh, everywhere on the same everywhere. And then Alice can notice, oh, she has an edge which is not covered by this uh, vertex cover. So she can just send it to Bob. And this will correspond to our cutting plane. Then you recompute the center of gravity. Now this edge will be covered. This, they sum up to more than one. Um, and let's say Bob look, looks through his edges, like this edge is also covered, but he may pick another edge like this edge down here, which is not covered. Then we can send it to Alice. Again, they update the center of gravity which they both can compute independently because it only depends on the common edges, which they both know now. And then they just repeat, finding 
and just one at a time. There's uh, two things which can happen at some point, like maybe Alice nor Bob will have an edge to send because all edges are covered by this fractional vertex cover, but then we're done. We have found a fractional vertex cover, which is a proof that the no perfect matching exists here. On the other hand, another thing which can happen is that the, the volume will become empty of this queue, like we'll get an empty polytope. And this only happens when among these common edges, which they both know, there is a, some perfect matching between them. And then Alice and Bob can just output this perfect matching and they're also done. So again, just to write down the algorithm in text as well, we start with, like they have some common edges, which starts being empty and we have this pull top Q. And while the volume is uh, positive, we find the center of gravity, which is a potential fractional vertex cover. And if either Alice or Bob finds a violating edge, they just send it and we update this polytope. If uh, not, then C is a fractional vertex cover and we're done, we can return it. And at the end, if the volume becomes zero, then among the common edges, we have a perfect matching. So quite simple. Let's also look at uh, how this can generalize to the other query models. So I'll just pick the simplest one for now and, and uh, talk about the OR query model. So the only thing we really need to change in this uh, algorithm is this uh, bullet point here, which is the like separation oracle implementation. In the communication model, like Alice and Bob together have to find a violating edge. In the OR query model, there is no concept of Alice and Bob. Instead, you can define a set S, which is all pairs of vertices U and V, which would not be covered if they were an edge. And then you can use these OR queries to just a binary search over this S to actually find an edge if one exists, which is violated. And that would be our separation oracle. So again, like log N OR queries to implement a separation oracle. And for the X randomized query algorithm and the quantum edge query algorithm, um, you do something similar. The only thing you need to implement is this like separation oracle step and massage it to work for the specific model you want, like query model. Okay, so let's do the analysis quickly. So a violated constraint just corresponds to an edge and takes only log n bits to send. And again, we terminate when either we found a fractional vertex cover of size at most n, no perfect matching in that case, or our polytope becomes empty and we have a perfect matching. And look at the number of iterations, we use this volume bound. Initially, we're contained in the zero one cube, hypercube. So the volume is at most one. So this is the two n dimensional volume here. And we have also argued that the volume is not too small, only like roughly uh, one over n to the n whenever our polytope is non-empty, which means that to decrease from one to this number, something smaller than this number here, we only need n log n iterations if we're halving the volume or like not halving, but reducing by a constant fraction in each step. So our algorithm runs an n log n iteration. Each iteration use log n bits of communication or log n or queries and so on. So yeah, this is basically it. And uh, our main result follows from this that we can solve by pattern matching in n log squared n bits of communication. Okay, let's look at a few extensions to this. So one cool thing about these cutting clean methods is that they just work on a linear program. So we have this linear program again for minimum vertex cover, but we are free to add some coefficients here. So we can add some demands for each vertex and the costs for each edge. And this would actually, this linear program would correspond to the dual of maximum cost B matching. So uh, here a vertex can be matched to BV number of times and uh, you're not no longer searching for the uh, maximum number of edges, but the maximum weight, the maximum cost of the edges in your matching. And uh, yeah, like again, this and LP is integral and everything just works out. Like the same approach of cutting planes can also solve this maximum cost B matching problem. And in fact, then a lot of other problems. So if we assume the weights, cost capacities or demands, like all input numbers are polynomial in N, then we can solve all these problems in 
and log squared end communication. So as mentioned, the max cost uh, bipartite B matching, uh, also vertex capacitated min cost ST flow, transshipment, negative weight single source, source shortest path, and also minimum mean cycle, and probably a few other problems who just immediately work here. Um, a common theme among all these problems is that in their optimal answer, they only have n edges, linear in the number of vertices. And this is kind of necessary, at least using our approach to get an algorithm running in this kind of uh, um, communication, because in each round, we actually send an edge of our graph. And at the end, they will know the edges in the op optimal answer. Okay. I also want to briefly discuss the query lower bound. Um, it's also relatively simple. So, and let's discuss it for the and query model. So this is a model where we do not get this like linear running time, but uh, instead provide a lower bound instead. And so here we look at, remember the and query, you can ask about some potential set of pairs if all of these are actually edges of some hidden graph. Okay, we just looked at the communication model and we can do a very small adjustment to this communication model. Instead of looking at the union, we look at the intersection of Alice's and Bob's graph. And this is actually very useful and very related to the anchory model because now if there is an anchory algorithm, then Alice and Bob can implement it in the communication model on this intersection. In fact, if you have an anchor algorithm and they try to simulate it, they ask about some query set S, then Alice can check, are all these edges part? Like, is there any edge missing for her? And Bob checks, is there any edge missing for him? And then together they see if any edge is missing in this intersection graph. So one and query can be simulated here with two bits of communication. So in terms of lower bounds, we can look at this communication problem, which turns out to be much harder when looking at the intersection graph than on the union graph. And if we give a lower bound for this communication model, we also get the lower bound for the and query model. So let's look at this graph here with some purple edges, which we know, like we can even tell Alice and Bob that both of Alice and Bob have these edges. So they will be in the intersection graph. And note here that we have an almost perfect matching, like everything, like you can choose all these edges and all these edges to be in the matching and the only unmatched vertices are these two at the end. And then Alice and Bob will also have some edges in this middle layer. And I claim that there exists a perfect matching in this in intersection graph. If Alice and Bob together like share an edge, like there exists an edge in this middle layer, which is in, in the actual intersection graph. So for example, this edge down here. And that's because if this edge exists, you have an augmenting path from here, going through here to here. So, and in fact, here we have roughly like N squared bits of information on which edges exist. And we just need to check if Alice and Bob has like a single bit which overlaps in the same place. And this is a well-known set intersection problem. And it's well known that even in randomized, this needs like linear number of communication, the number of bits, in this case, n squared. So a quite clean lower bound. In fact, if instead you look, of the, look at the intersection graph, you look at like the symmetric difference graph, you can get lower bounds for XOR queries, for instance. Okay. So this is summarizes the technical part of my talk. So just to summarize our results, we have these, uh, mostly our paper is about upper bounds and just applying this communication, uh, no, applying this uh, cutting things method seems to work really well in the communication model. And we close down for like com two party communication, quantum edge query or XOR and AND query. We, we have our new upper bounds and also the lower bound. Okay, so now, Onto the fun part of the talk, which are some open problems and things to work on in the future. So one cool open problem is 
in our algorithm, we use a lot of rounds of communication. They, Alice and Bob alternate by sending a lot of messages to each other. In fact, in our cutting things method, we use n log n rounds and in each round like log n bits, like a single edge we send. So we have this trade-off, like we use a lot of rounds, but not too much communication. On the other hand, the trivial algorithm, we can use this one round where Alice sends all her edges to Bob, but this needs a lot of communication. And what is the trade-off in between here? What happens if you use say like root and rounds, like how little communication do you need? Or say like polylog rounds. And this is both formally and informally very related to lots of different other models of computations like streaming where the rounds would correspond to the number of passes or like distributed or MPC. So all this model of computation and like in a lot of these models, it seems like this uh, round versus communication trade-off, like even the two party setting have kind of been like a bottleneck for improving algorithms in these settings. So I think yeah, either studying these settings directly or studying like the communication setting for with this like round versus communication trade-off would be very interesting. Another open problem I'll mention is uh, what about approximation algorithms? Like here we talked about exact algorithms. We know that in n log squared n using cutting planes, we can get an exact, like a one approximation. If we just need a two approximation, it's sufficient for just Alice or Bob to find the maximum matching themselves in their own graphs. And one of them must include at least uh, half of the edges, like either Alice or Bob has half of the edges of the actual ma maximum matching. So you can get a two approximation by just sending the size here. And here we, we talk about the size version because if they would need to output even like a constant approximation, then that would already be linear number of edges, which say like Alice has to think about. But if they just care about the size here, we have this gap say for a two approximation, we only need log n bits of communication for a one like exact, we need linear communication. What lies in between? Like how, Good approximation ratio can you, for instance, get with like polylog communication? Yes. Okay, another problem is to look at this, we keep to this communication model or query models, and we look at other problems. Like maybe the most natural one to look at as a follow up is that of general matching instead of bipartite matching. Our algorithm only works for bipartite matching because we need this uh, integrality of the linear program. And this like yeah, duality between uh, max between matching and uh, vertex cover. So, like in general, in like all different models, like the interplay between general and bipartite matching is quite unclear, and I think it's very interesting to investigate it. And so maybe this communication model could shed some light on what is possible or not. It's all like the communication model also lends itself very nicely for like lower bounds if one want to show like some gap between general and bipartite matching because you can use information theoretical techniques in communication models. Um, yes, I also want to note that if you're searching for the optimal fractional matching instead of like integral matching, like the same approach as I just presented just works because we just care about the linear program finding the optimal solution to linear program. Like why I think it might be possible to get solve general matching is that again, the answer only has linear number of edges. And we saw for a lot of problem where the answers only have linear number of edges, it might be possible. But again, the linear program is quite unwieldy. Either it's like allows for fractional solutions or if not, and you actually only want a linear program for maximum matching, like integral maximum matching, then you need exponential number of uh, constraints or variables in the dual. So I think this is a very interesting research direction as well. Another problem would be max flow, another generalization of bipartite matching. Here, like our approach does not quite work because both the dual and primal have like up to n squared variables. And in fact, the answer might include like n squared edges in it. Like if you look at the maximum flow and all edges which are part of this flow, it might be up to, like all edges might be used. So here, an approach where you send an edge in each round between Alice and Bob 
would not work because then you need to send all edges. However, there is some proof that, like some suggestions that maybe we can achieve something sublinear, like something maybe ON, and then non certificate complexity, like if we have an Oracle, which just helps us guessing on what to send, then it's possible to achieve linear time. So it's also an interesting direction. Um, yes. And uh, this concludes my talk here. I listed like the open problems again and a few other, like there are a few other query models. You can also look at other uh, communicate, like uh, problems in this two-party setting. And uh, maybe you can even look at the multi-party communication as well. Like our approach works for like polylog parties instead of just two. But if you get up to like linear parties, you have like N players, where the graph is partitioned over, it's it's not as clear on what to do. So thank you all for listening and I'm happy to respond to any questions. So for general matchings, is the best known just like sending all the edges or can you do something um, better? Yes, so certainly you can send all the edges. I think you can get like n root n as well by essentially doing this blocking flow idea. But this blocking flow idea is a bit complicated in general matching case than the bipartite matching case. But there is like an n over epsilon approximation algorithm and then a single augmenting path after that you can find in linear number of uh, queries by implementing that first search or that first search. So I think it would be possible to implement it in n root n by just implementing like sequential algorithms. Uh, but I, I have not verified this, but, uh, but great question. Okay, um, so thanks for Kim. And as promised, I'll take us off the recording.